Section 15.5, surface area. Let S be a surface with equation Z equals F of XY, where F has continuous partial derivatives. We define the surface area of S to be the limit of the double Riemann sum of delta Tij, where delta Tij is the part of the tangent plane to S at the point Pij on the surface corresponding to a rectangle Rij in the domain D of F. So here's what we do. We draw some little rectangle in the domain of F, and then we look at the corresponding patch of the surface. So some little uh, like cutout of the surface, the orange part in this case, that corresponds to this rectangle. And then on that patch, we draw a, a parallelogram built out of the uh, tangent plane to that point that we uh, use to find the rectangle to begin with, the uh, sample point Pij. So you have to be a little bit careful here because from the picture it kind of looks like this tangent plane is the same as this rectangle, but it's not. This piece of tangent plane is a parallelogram, but this rectangle is actually a rectangle with a 90 degree angle. You just can't really see it so well because of the 3D perspective. So in order to try to figure out a better way to compute surface area, because obviously we don't want to do the limit of the double Riemann sum of something in the tangent plane, we come up with this formula over here. And uh, let's prove this real quick. So we let A and B be the vectors that start at Pij. So they lie along the sides of this parallelogram delta Tij. So let's say over here is A, and then over here can be B. So this is one vector, this is another vector. And then the uh, area of the parallelogram delta Tij is the magnitude of the cross product of those vectors, as we've seen taking the cross product, taking the, the length of the cross product, that's the area of the parallelogram formed by those two vectors. Then uh, the partial derivatives fx and fy are the slopes of the tangent lines through Pij in the directions of a and b. So notice if you're looking in the direction of a, then this is a vector in three-dimensional space, so it's got i, j, and k. But we're thinking that um, this is for the uh, tangent space. So that means that if I go in the direction of A, my uh, Y value is constant. So there is no um, movement in the J direction. So J is zero. So all they have is the movement in the X direction, which is I, so that's just the change in X. And then I have the movement up or down along the Z axis, the K direction, which is just whatever the slope is, the partial derivative fx times however much we change delta x. So that gives me a, and then similarly for b, if we're looking in this direction, then we have no change in um, i, we have no change in x, because x is constant over there. So that means that we just have delta yj, and we just have the partial times delta y for our k movement. So that's the vectors that form that uh, parallelogram in the tangent plane. So then we want the cross product, we want to take the magnitude. So taking the cross product, we form our uh, matrix, take the determinant. So for i, we take this times this, which is zero, minus this times this. So that's our i. And then for j, we take this times this, which is this, and then this times this is zero. And then for j, we always put a minus. And then for k, we have delta x delta y and 0 times 0, so we just have delta x delta y. Notice we have delta x delta y in all of our components, so we can factor that out as delta a. So now we just want the uh, magnitude of this thing. So taking the magnitude, that's the square root of each of these components squared. Notice there's an invisible one over here. So that's the partial derivative with respect to x squared, partial derivative with respect to y squared, and 1 squared is 1. We take the square root, and that's it. So then when we take the limit of this double Riemann sum, it becomes the integral. So we get the exact formula that we wanted. Notice how similar this is to um, our formula for the area of a surface of revolution. But notice this one doesn't require any revolution. We can just take the surface area now of any surface using a double integral. So how about we do some examples?
Let's see if we can find the surface area of the part of the surface C equals x squared plus 2y that lies above the triangular region T in the xy plane with these vertices. So how about we draw this region? Okay, so this is what we're going to integrate over. We have the origin as one of the vertices. We have 1, 1 and 1, 0. So get this nice triangle over here. So here's 1, 1, and here's 1, 0, and we can call this triangle T. So notice that this is what we integrate over. I have not drawn the actual surface that we're taking the surface area of, that's in 3D, but we can still do our integral without that. We want to describe this region as a type 1 or type 2. It looks like it's probably easier to just call it a type 1 region and say that this is y equals x, but it actually really doesn't make a difference. You could make it x equals y and then make it type 2, but we just default to type 1. So that means that our triangle T can be described as the points x, y, such that x is between constant values 0 and 1, and y is between functions of x, 0 and x. So that means that our surface area A will be the double integral over T of the square root of our partial, so partial of this with respect to x is 2x, and uh, we have to square that. And then we take the uh, partial with respect to y, which is just 2, and we square that. And then we add 1, uh, dA. So we can express that as the iterated integral using Fubini of the integral from 0 to 1, the integral 0 to x, square root 4x squared plus 2 squared is 4 plus 1 is 5, dy dx is type 1. So then we do our first integral and we get the integral from 0 to 1 of x times the square root of 4x squared plus 5, because the entire thing is just a constant with respect to y, which is nice. And that's dx. And we get um, 1 8 times 2 thirds times 4x squared plus 5 all to the 3 halves power. It evaluated from 1 to 0 to 1, and we get 1 12th times 27 minus 5 rad 5. So remember that's not the area of this thing, it's the area of the surface that lies above it, z equals x squared plus 2y. How about another example? We'll find the area of the part of the paraboloid z equals x squared plus y squared that lies under the plane z equals 9. So let's try drawing our paraboloid because notice they didn't give us the region we're integrating over in this case. So we'll have to determine that ourselves, but it won't be too bad. So for our paraboloid, notice the axis is the z-axis. So let's see. It looks something like this. And then I can put my uh, axis poking out. So here's z. And here's y. And let's see if I can do x. Okay, notice that in this case, it's not uh, infinite. It doesn't just keep going up because it has to lie under the plane z equals 9. So usually I just draw it like this, even though it keeps on going. But in this case, it actually is cut off over here at z equals 9. So that means that I, there is some specific part in the xy plane that this thing is over. It's all the things that, you know, this thing shadows, you know or the, the shadow of this uh, basically top part, that's where it's the widest. So in fact, I could draw that in the xy plane as like a little disk, something maybe like this. And notice if z is equal to nine and z is x squared plus y squared, so this top part is x squared plus y squared equals nine. So this disk has a radius of three. So how would I call that disk d? And that's what we're integrating over. So our surface area is the double integral over d of the square root of 1 plus 
each of our partial derivatives squared. So partial z with respect to x plus partial z with respect to y. And I'm going to plug in now for our partial derivatives because we can do that pretty quick is 1 plus 2x squared plus 2y squared. And let's see, we're going to have a factor out a little bit because it looks like we have a 4 in both of these guys. So I could write this as the square root of 1 plus 4 times x squared plus y squared dA. And notice that might be a little bit of a mess, except that this is a circle, a circular region. We've got x squared plus y squared. It looks pretty natural to convert this to polar coordinates. I hope that simplifies stuff. So in polar coordinates, our region can be described as, well, it's a circle, so it just has r going from 0 to 3 and theta going from 0 to 2 pi. So I'll write my outer integral for theta, 0 to 2 pi, my inner one for r, 0 to, oops, 0 to 3. And that means that my square root becomes 1 plus 4 r squared, because x squared plus y squared is just r squared. And then dA becomes r d r d theta. So I end up with two integrals, because notice this is just some function of r, and then I can write d theta separately, because there's no thetas hanging around. So I'll write 0 to 2 pi d theta as we often do when we integrate polar, and then 0 to 3 of 1 8 square root of 1 plus 4 r squared times 8 r dr. Notice I'm throwing in a 1 8 and 8 so that I can make this thing a little bit easier to integrate by a mental substitution. So for this guy, I just get 2 pi. And then for this guy, I just get 1 8 times 2 thirds 1 plus 4 r squared to the 3 halves power. So I evaluate that from 0 to 3 and I get pi over 6 times 37 radical 37 minus 1. 